All right, happy Thursday evening to everybody. So today I'm gonna to continue my discussion of virtue ethics. Um, last time, um, so on Tuesday evening, I discussed um, virtue ethics predominantly by discussing a bit of Aristotle. And so that'll continue to be the theme this time. Um, and then what I wanna do um, after working through quite a bit of that, um, uh, including the discussion of Aristotle is discuss uh, a recent virtue ethical view developed by a philosopher named Linda Zagzebski. So I'll just say a few things about that toward the end. Um, so we'll see what kind of progress that we make. So let me go ahead and share my screen again. Hopefully everybody's doing great. Happy Thursday. Hopefully you're staying warm and safe out there. Just drop that down. Okay, so thanks for watching everybody. Um, we saw that um, Aristotle's discussion of virtue was um, found in his discussion of uh, thinking about the highest good or the life exemplifying the highest good, uh, which is related to the question, uh, what is a good life? What is a good human life? We saw that um, Aristotle claims that the best human life has to include virtue and um, virtue is a kind of excellence. And uh, uh, the virtuous person is gonna be someone who experiences quite a bit of pleasure. So um, just kind of by way of default, the best human life is going to consist of quite a bit of pleasure. So we have virtue, we have pleasure. Those are gonna be parts of the best human life, the life exemplifying what I like to call the highest good. But that's not enough. Um, the life exemplifying the highest good also needs quite a bit of good fortune. So those individuals have to be born um, basically with good looks. Um, they have to be born to good parents who, who raise them well. They have to be born with some wealth, so some money available to them right, et cetera, et cetera. Um, other things that might be relevant would be um, um, that they're um, brought into the world, right, into a society that by, by and large is, um, you know, providing them with some freedom um, and other, you know, positive benefits. So um, that's, not, that's not intended to be an exhaustive set of conditions. But for Aristotle, at the very least, you gotta have virtue. Virtue is gonna guarantee pleasure. And then there's also going to be um, the fact that you gotta have quite a bit of good luck, good fortune in order to live the best human life. And to keep in mind that the good fortune, as it were, has to um, persist continuously throughout one's life. That doesn't mean there can't be any dips. It's just that there can't be very many of those dips. Um, the dips might um, be defined as, you know, bad fortune or in terms of bad fortune. Okay. When it comes to thinking about the best human life, um, Aristotle claims that virtue is very important, perhaps the most important, because it's something that we have under our control, at least to some degree, despite the fact that he claims that um, the virtuous life is gonna depend significantly on who raises, who raises us. So, um, Having, having parents who care about cultivating virtue uh, in their children will be very significant to the levels of virtue that can um, plausibly be attained or particularly be attained in this lifetime. Okay. Not to mean that there's no overcoming uh, humble beginnings in this regard, but it's just that um, it's gonna, uh, the hill, it becomes extremely uh, more steep the um, less one's parents care about instilling uh, moral virtue. Okay, yeah, in them. Okay. So then, you know, by the end of the first book of the Nicomachean Ethics, where Aristotle's discussion of the highest good takes place, uh, it seems like we've got something like a picture of what uh, life exemplifying the highest good is going to be like. Maybe the job is done. Aristotle says, no, we still have to know what virtue is. Okay. So, whatever virtue is, whatever moral virtue is, it's something that makes someone who has it more excellent. So we can think about um, 
we can think about virtue as a um, as something that makes one who has it more excellent. Virtue as an excellence. What's going to make a human being excellent is going to be related to their rational faculty or the fact that they have reason. So um, what distinguishes humans from other living things like animals and plants is the fact that human beings can reason about things. And so Aristotle came is sort of the clue to um, living virtuously, living excellently as human beings is to be found um, in thinking about the excellent use of human reason. The excellent, the excellent use of the human rational faculty, which has two sort of distinct sub faculties, as it were, that are related to each other, or at least two aspects. They need to be sub faculties. That might not might have been the that might not have been the accurate way of putting it. There's but the rational faculty has a theoretical side and a practical side. Where the theoretical side is dominantly in, interested in truth, you know, getting by right, the true scientific claims in true metaphysical claims, et cetera. Um, and the practical side of the rational faculty is that side of the rational faculty that's concerned with action. So um, um, the theoretical side of, of the rational faculty is concerned with but it, helping us arrive at true beliefs generally. And then the practical side of the rational faculty is, is concerned with helping us right, arrive at your know, correct actions. And in both cases, there are reasoning processes right in place. Okay. All right. So um, we got to get up the the Hearst House here. I have the Hearst House down here. I need to get it up. So um, I'm going to follow the Hearst House here a little bit. Her explanations, uh, virtue as an excellence. I find her discussion there um, very um, intuitive and compelling. So let me track it down here on my desktop. I've got it here somewhere. Oh, there it is. I thought I had it up earlier, but oh, I think I did. Yeah. Um, good. So I think we need to go to page 62, right? Because that's what it begins. Page 62 of the reading. If you if you have it up, if not, we'll look at some passages from the uh, Hearst House together. Um, so Hearst House emphasizes the idea that for Aristotle, virtues be understood as excellence. Okay. So let's look at the passage. So virtue arete, as I've already introduced the, um, the ancient or the Greek term. The initial difficulties, per uh, notes, in establishing virtue ethics as a robust rival to consequentialism and deontology, like the last um, two subject matters we discussed. Um, before getting to virtue ethics, owed much to the fact that modern readers unacquainted with ancient philosophy took the standard translation of arete, namely virtue, as perfectly adequate. And to some extent, the difficulty persists to this day. It's the standard but more accurate translation is excellence. So arete to be translated as excellence as opposed to just virtue. That's why I try to emphasize, you know, um, before getting to this passage in the Hearst House, the fact that virtue is a kind of excellence, it's the kind of thing that makes um, its possessor more excellent. Because I agree with Hearst House on this interpretive point. Um, and ethikai arete are excellences of character. So the term ethics is related to the term that we have for character. So ethikai arete would be excellences of character as opposed to what Aristotle calls intellectual excellences such as wisdom and scientific understanding. Okay. Um, I, these are related more to the theoretical aspects of, of, of reason and excellent uses of reason, intellectual excellence. Here's how the excellence translation makes a difference. Something that is excellent is as good of, a, of its kind as it could be could reasonably be expected to be. Think of ex an excellent first year uh, philosophy essay. And we do not say that anything is too excellent. Okay, so excellence is sort of a superlative in its own right. Uh, but the modern uses of virtue does not work quite the same way. So we were talking about like linguistic use, um, given the quotes around the, the term. 
Um, we may say that someone has the virtues of compassion and generosity, but deny that in these areas, he's as good as anyone could be. We would, um, we would, we say, or he would, we say, be better if you were not so virtuous. He is too compassionate or generous, liable to, for example, lie rather than hurt someone's feelings. Uh, find himself unable to kill the bird his cat has mauled or impoverish himself and his family through living too lavishly um, or giving too lavishly to others. The point that Hearst House is making here is that the contemporary usage of the term virtue doesn't track the way in which we might use the term excellent. The term excellent, um, excellent is kind of a superlative um, it's the best way you could be good. Um, virtue tends to be used, she thinks, and she claims in ways that uh, are consistent with saying that someone's too virtuous, because we might specify various traits or aspects of a person that we claim are virtuous, and they say that in some cases, some people can be too virtuous, they could be too honest, they could be too compassionate. I think it to be too giving as the example is just given show. Now, I think that like from my vantage point, people don't really use the term virtue very often, or at least anecdotally in my you know, conversations and what I hear in conversations around me. Um, and I've been trained as a philosopher to understand Aristotle's meaning of virtue as a kind of excellence. So I wouldn't myself use the term virtue in these kinds of ways. So um, we'll, um, we'll go ahead and give it to her. So we'll give her the benefit of the doubt that she's, what she's saying here tracks something true. I think there's something to what she's saying here. Someone could be too compassionate, too giving, right? Too honest. So then she continues, now it would be foolish to maintain that it is incorrect to talk this way. Right. It'd be foolish to try to correct ordinary language and how people use ordinary language. It is, however, incorrect to talk that way if you're trying to talk about arete, virtue as excellence. What you say instead is that the agent in question does not have the excellence or of, or of compassion or of generosity. Though seemingly well on the way to be excellent in these ways, with his heart in the right place, he is not yet good as he could be, as good as he could be. We know of or can readily imagine people who are compassionate without being dishonest or squeamish. And generous without being prodigal, and they are better than he is. Now, I think that what Hershoff is after here, at least in part, if I'm understanding her correctly, is just that there's um, a difference in the way in which we use virtue terminology compared to how maybe you know Aristotle used it, and that maybe how the more careful, technical, um, technically driven philosophers use the term virtue. And so when discussing virtue ethics, we, gotta, we have to discuss virtue. We have to be sure that we're using the term in the way that's relevant. So we've been talking about Aristotle. Aristotle talks about virtue. And we have to be clear that we, we've got Aristotle's a meaning of virtue, linguistic meaning of virtue, you know, just right. And we're not sort of tempted to Think about virtue in the way in which we might ordinarily, right? We have to think about virtue um, more in a more technical uh, way in which it's it's meant. So, um, right, in order to get virtue ethics just right, okay. And I find that, like in my personal experience of you know, teaching virtue ethics, that virtue talk. And discussing the virtues is um, not, um, it's not at least, um, it's, not, it's not common enough. So I have to do quite a bit of work in just discussing like what virtue is, what virtue means, even in the colloquial senses of the term. And then, um, and then try to provide um, examples um, and then try to, provide examples that are more aligned with what Aristotle had in mind and other you know, philosophers who are in the Aristotelian tradition or just in the virtue ethics tradition more generally. So last time, remember I introduced the 
for cardinal virtues, it's very uncommon for, um, for students that I have to know what those cardinal virtues are. Wisdom, courage, justice, temperance, okay? When I ask students to list virtues, they'll maybe say things like honesty and sympathy or empathy. They'll, they'll, they'll list off these things, and perhaps those are virtues as well. Um, but they tend to mean them in the way that Hearst House has in mind here. Because then I'll ask, well, can someone be too compassionate? Can they be too honest? And students will typically say, well, of course they can. And that tracks for Hearst House too. They, they'll say that at least sometimes, not always, but they will sometimes say that. So I say that there's at least a kernel of truth in what Hearst House is claiming here. So keep in mind that when we're talking about virtue as an excellence, we're talking about a kind of a superlative. So if someone is virtuous, um, and the way they're virtuous, at least in part, is defined by the fact that they're honest, but they can't be too honest, okay? And if someone is virtuous, also in part by being compassionate, they can't be too compassionate, right? And if they're, if they're virtuous in part by being giving or generous, they can't be too generous in their giving, okay? As we're gonna understand these notions, okay. Okay, so again, just continuing with, the, continuing with this virtue as excellence theme, understood in this way, virtue is a character trait involved dispositions to feel and act in good ways. So we're, we're sort of adding here, right? So virtue is a kind of excellence. We've gotten clear on what that excellence means. It doesn't mean, you know, good, but not best or something like that. Good, good, but, um, um, good, but not such that um, there's no room for improvement or some such, okay? Or good that, or good in such a way that there, there's also you know, room for vice. Okay, but now we've got this other um, aspect of virtuous excellence that's important to Aristotle's view and other virtue ethicists' view, uh, following the Aristotelian tradition at the very least. Understood in this way, virtue is, is a character trait involving dispositions to feel and act in good ways. Okay. So we have virtue as excellence generally. Next section, virtue as a character trait involving dispositions to um, certain feelings and act, as well as actions. Following the Hearst House here, he says more of you look at virtue in the modern dictionary, won't tell you the essential thing about its genus, the general kind of thing that it is, that um, namely that virtue has excellence in ethical context is a character trait. If, if you have an ethike arete, you are excellent in character. An excellent character trait is a well entrenched or settled state of a person a certain sort of way they are through and through all the way down, which involves the disposition of a very complex sort. It's not just a tendency to act in, a cert in, in certain ways for as Aristotle constantly asserts, excellences of character are to do with actions and feelings or emotions. So it's not just tendencies to act, it's also tendencies to have emotions, to feel. But neither is it just being prone to feel and being prompted to action by feeling, for example, compassion or an impulse to give. This brings feelings in the feelings in the wrong way. Quite small children can have that tendency. And when adults have the same tendency to act on emotional impulse like children, they are not, as we saw above, excellent in character, but are, but for example, too compassionate or generous. So we have to sort of qualify what it means to have these certain um, emotional responses, um, these certain um, actions and feelings, actions and emotions that are relevant to um, having a virtuous character. And so Hearst House continues, the Aristotelian way to bring in feelings is as follows, the famous passage from the Nicomachean Ethics, NE. The pleasure or pain that supervenes on what people do should be taken as a sign of their dispositions. For someone who holds back from bodily pleasures and does so cheerfully is, is a temperate person. Remember that uh, fourth of the cardinal virtues discussed last time. While someone who's upset at doing so is self-indulgent, and someone who withstands frightening things and does so cheerfully or anyway without distress is a courageous person. Remember, I talked about how courage needs to be understood in the context of fear for Aristotle. Likewise, being temperate is understood in the context of responding to um, pleasure and pain. For excellence of character has to do with the pleasures, for excellence of character, excuse me, has to do with pleasures and pains. This is why we must have been brought up in a certain way from childhood onwards, as Plato says, so as to, as to delight in and be distressed by the things that we should be. 
so this being you know brought up you know certainly from childhood it's a very very important point from the Aristotle as I've anticipated um, and he got that from Plato okay so essence of character involves a disposition to act in certain ways for certain reasons so that's sort of the rational components right related to um, the excellence of character, right? Having a virtuous character. Um, um, not just on emotional impulse and feelings are involved particularly because of the relevance of how the agent feels about what she does. Doing what one should reliably for appropriate reasons is not enough for excellence of character. Let me read that again. Doing what one should reliably for appropriate reasons is not enough for excellence of character because someone who gives to or aids another reluctantly, unwillingly, with difficulty, is not as good as the one who does the same thing gladly and easily. So here, I think note, note, note that the um, that the domain of assessment is the agent herself, as opposed to the agent's actions. Okay. So um, just again to repeat, doing what one should reliably for appropriate reasons, but that kind of description of things should make 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 you think about Kant's view, right? Is not enough for excellence of character because someone who gives to or aids another reluctantly, unwillingly, and with difficulty is not as good as the one who does the same things gladly and easily. So that's why she notes above that excellence of character involves a disposition to act in certain ways for certain reasons, not just on emotional impulse, but doing what one should reliably for appropriate reasons is not enough for essence of character because you also have to have this component that in addition to ha having the good reasons for acting you're so, you're willingly acting from those reasons you're not doing so begrudgingly you're not doing so sort of painfully right there's a sort of cheerfulness an open willingness associated with acting for those reasons okay now just as a side note here um, I do think that this, this way of understanding things is actually consistent with aspects of Kant that are underappreciated. Um, Kant wrote a work where he, he discusses, it's called, the, it's called the metaphysics of morals, not the grounder for the metaphysics of morals, where he discusses um, uh, some of these um, issues related to character. He has a section of that work um, 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 devoted to the doctrine of virtue, as he calls it, okay, which I encourage everyone to check out if you're interested in Kant. Um, so I didn't mean that um, um, passage there that I read a moment ago to be um, intended as a as a shot against Kant. I just thought that um, when you think about doing what one should from the appropriate reasons, that should conjure up Kant to mind. So I didn't mean that as a you know this is a refutation or uh, a claim that was uh, made in, in an attempt to challenge Kant. Okay, though some might want to do so. Just this this bit should conjure up Kant. Right. Um, it turns out, you know, just I'll just say one last thing. I, I can't help myself on this point because um, I did I did mention something in Kant about this. So Kant does think that remember um, when we act morally, we act for a moral reason. Um, Kant's wary of remember feelings as being the basis of our actions, and I think that 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 feelings generally are the kinds of things that can um, be moral, can be moral guides to our action. Um, but he does end up claiming that, and this is um, found even in the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals, he does end up claiming that there is a, a moral feeling that, that, that we can have, and it's, it's respect. It's respect for, um, for, for moral reasons, respect for, for morality. And that's the kind of feeling that can, produce a, it can generate in us, produce a kind of willingness, right? Uh, um, a kind of cheerfulness uh, as we act for the correct reasons when we act. Okay, um, the best way for us to be with our emotions, feelings, in, um, for us to be is with our emotions, feelings in harmony with our reason, so they do not pull in opposite directions, right? So that, that's sort of that, that willingness, that, that cheerfulness or the lack of distress that can kick in in some, some cases, um, um, being part of, um, are acting for those good reasons. So it was all going together. So that way we're not just acting for good reasons and there's emotions and feelings that pull against right, the acting for good reasons because there's a kind of begrudgingness or an unwillingness that's 
taken root in someone's heart, soul, etc. Um, someone whose reasoning characteristically conquers her bad impulses and who acts as she as as she should is good. Right. So here we're assessing the agent, not the action. We're assessing the agent. The agent is the one with the character, the one who has the, the, the developed character. So you just might think that when we assess an agent, when we assess a person, in part what we're doing is we're assessing right, their character, right? how they're disposed to behave, how they're disposed to feel. Okay. Someone whose impulses are in harmony with their reasons is excellent. In Aristotelian vocabulary, this is the contrast between mere continence or strength of will and virtue. So continence is strength of will. Um, so there might be those who have these feelings that are you know, begrudging, right? Um, when it comes to performing an action for, for a right reason, um, but through strength of will, they're able to push through those feelings to act for the right reasons, et cetera. But the, the person who is excellent is one whose reason for acting, right? is accompanied with these feelings, right? These, um, uh, these feelings that we're disposed to have, right? That are positive, if I could put it um, in that kind of general way. Okay, so I'm trying to just give you kind of a sense of what it, what it means, right? Um, to discuss Aristotelian virtue and to discuss virtue in the way in which um, many virtue ethicists talk about it. Again, understood in this way, virtue has an excellence. Virtue is a character trait involving dispositions to feel and act in good ways. We saw virtue as excellence also, right, involving kind of the superlative way of being, the superlative way of acting, right? Okay. Um, I've already read the passage about feelings and actions from page 63 there. Okay, so continuing on with the theme of virtue as excellence in the Hearst House. If, uh, if virtue is a character trait that disposes someone to act and feel excellently, well, what is a character trait? Okay, what is a character trait? Or how do we know maybe, maybe the better question is how do we know that we're, when we're assessing an agent, how do we know that we've locked in on a character trait as opposed to something else? As opposed to some other trait that's had by the individual or some other property or feature had by an individual. So Hearst House uh, tries to give us a test for a character trait. Okay, so um, I'm gonna pick up where I left off. Um, the commonest mistake amongst opponents of virtue ethics has been to take just one or perhaps two aspects of this complex disposition and identify it as, as a virtue. So as we just saw, those who complain that the virtue of compassion may lead its possessor to act wrongly are assuming it, are assuming, excuse me, that it is no more than the strong tendency to be promoted to action by the emotion of compassion, ignoring the role that acting for certain sorts of reasons plays um, in the role of a character trait. So ignoring the role that acting for certain sorts of reasons plays in the concept of, of a character trait. Those who think that virtue ethics is covertly relying on deontology assume, or duty-based ethics, assume that a virtue is a subtle tendency to act in accordance with deontological rules because they are, because they are right, to act in accordance with deontological rules because they are right, talking about the rules being right. But even if you do so with, with difficulty, ignoring the distinction between continence and virtue. Right, so the, 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 the idea here, just building on what was you know, noted in this parenthetical at the end of the previous paragraph is just that there may be, there may be um, uh, philosophers who, or theorists otherwise who criticize a virtue ethics just saying that's a kind of deontological theory in disguise um, because at the end of the day, what's significant, they, the, the deontologists in claim is acting, um, acting from the right reasons or acting for the right reasons. Now, of course, this would just what kind of deontology this would be like a Kantian deontology is something I emphasized in the, um, in the lecture on Tuesday. Um, but still, like running with that kind of understanding of deontology, which is obviously a limited way of thinking about it, uh, too narrow way of thinking about it. 
Um, the virtue ethicist response here that Herbst House gives is that no, it's not just acting for good reasons that's significant to a virtue ethics, those, though that is crucial. It's, it's acting with a good reason all the while having right, feelings, right? And a general attitude, right? General set of attitudes that's positively right, related to acting for those right reasons. Okay, so um, it, it might be consistent with some deontological theories, some Kantian theories, depending on how they're worked out, that, um, that, that, the, that the right action, the morally right action is one that just has like, the good reasons, right, the right reasons for acting, um, right, but they ignore the, the component of having sort of a cheerful disposition as Right, one is performing the right actions for the right reasons. And what um, Herself is saying on behalf of the virtue ethicist here, Herself is a virtue ethicist, what Herself is saying you know, as a virtue ethicist is just that the virtue ethicist is, 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 all, is also emphasizing um, uh, these very important um, positive dispositions, right, emotions and feelings that accompany I right, don't pull against the good reasons that we have when we act uh, correctly. So the importance of the, of, of the point that the virtues or essences are character traits comes up again in relation to various arguments that are brought against some of these versions. In one naturalistic version, it is claimed that the virtues are those character traits that perfect our nature as rational social animals. Some philosophers object to this view on grounds that, that this entails that homosexuality is a vice and that it cannot do justice to the idea that vegetarianism may well be a virtue. But neither homosexuality nor vegetarianism are character traits. And so the objection does not get off the ground. So some might wanna say that you know, someone's sexual orientation is a character trait. Someone might say that someone eating a vegetarian diet is a character trait, okay? Um, and then go on to you know, run their, um, um, run their challenges as it were, perhaps to a virtue ethical view, okay? Now, um, keep in mind, you know, Herschel is taking no stand on, right, the ethics of homosexuality or the, the, the ethics of vegetarianism. She's using these as just examples, okay? And there are those in the literature who would challenge, um, who would challenge um, virtue ethics, at least some versions of virtue ethics, on the grounds that it doesn't get the right result with respect to the ethics of homosexuality. Okay. Um, Hershaus's very general reply is um, it's not a character trait in the first place. Sexual orientation is not a character trait. Okay. Just like many might not get right the ethics of, uh, of, of, of you know, vegetarianism, the ethics of Death is of what we eat, perhaps more generally, right? And they might they might try to run various arguments by thinking about vegetarianism as a character trait. Her house is I mean, those mean a vegetarian isn't a isn't a character trait. So here we go. A good test for whether or not Xness, right? So um, you think about X is just a variable, or you could fill it in for whether or not um, um, being homosexual or um, whether or not being heterosexual or um, whether or not being vegetarian, right, um, is a character trait, just ask yourself, this is the test. If I know that someone is X, do I thereby know quite a lot about what the person does and would do in certain circumstances and what they would think and feel about doing, about so doing, and for what reasons and how they would think about and react to certain actions and emotions of others? The point here, right, the big picture point here is there's a lot of detail, right, in the test. But the general point here is that a character trait is something that um, if you know about a person, it will also help you know quite a bit about what that person thinks, about how they're inclined to act, et cetera, et cetera. So a character trait is the kind of thing that if you know about that person, then you'll know quite a bit more about the person. Or it allows you, it's sort of, a, it's a window into quite a bit about the person. And what Herschel is going to claim is the mere fact that someone is homosexual 
isn't a window into a ton of facts about that person. It isn't a window to knowing quite about what the person does and we do in certain certain what they would do in certain circumstances and what they would think and feel about doing so and for what reasons and how they would think about and react to certain actions and emotions of others. It gives you a window into their sexual preferences. It doesn't give you a window into their character, right? The, the, the character just being this sort of this crucial aspect that opens up right, a window into what the person is like in very, very deep fundamental ways. Okay. And then you're on the vegetarianism, right? Vegetarianism, you can know that someone's a vegetarian, but that doesn't give you a window into like why they're vegetarian. It doesn't give you a window into a, right, a whole range of other you know, claims about the individual. So knowing that someone is a vegetarian doesn't count as a character, a character trait. It doesn't pass the character trait test that we're given here. Once again, a good test for whether or not Xness, some property other, some feature that's had by someone is a character trait is to ask yourself, if I know that someone is an X, right? Do I thereby know quite a lot about what the person does and would do in certain circumstances and what they would think and feel about doing so and for what reasons and how, and for what reasons and how they would think about and react to certain actions and emotions of others? If I know that someone's homosexual, they're sexually oriented in that way. Do I thereby know quite a lot about what the person does and would do in certain circumstances? Plausibly, we wouldn't, right? You just know something about their sexual orientation. Would we know what they would think and feel about, about doing so? Right? About, or, sorry, about so doing. We wouldn't, right? Because we don't know the answer to the first. We don't know about the first part. So how would you know about the second part? You know, how they think and feel about the um what the person does and we do in certain circumstances right let me just put very generally and for what reasons and how they would think about and react to certain actions and emotions of others we wouldn't be able to answer those questions because we can't answer the we, can, we can't deal with you know these last two aspects of the question because we don't know how to deal with the first two aspects of the question we don't know the answer to those and the same thing would be true if we talked about someone being a vegetarian Okay, so I, I anticipate what she says in response. So, um, so whatever a character trait is, it's something that would reveal quite a bit about someone in terms of how they're inclined to act, their reasons for acting, and how they respond, right, to um, to various actions and um, attitudes that others have, okay, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, good. Uh, virtue as excellence, just continuing with the theme here. Virtue is a character trait that also, not that, that also, but that also disposes of possessor to act for excellent reasons. This could already be anticipated based on our uh, discussion to this point. But again, following the uh, Hearst House, virtue as a disposition to act for certain reasons. What sorts of reasons? Does someone with the excellences of character do things or do the things they characteristically do? The famous passage Aristotle draws the distinction between doing what is temperate or just, or as we might say right, and doing it temperately or justly or quote unquote rightly. So there's, there's a distinction between doing what is temperate and doing something temperately. There's, it's one thing to do something it's another thing to do something just. It's another thing to do that just thing justly. It's one thing to do something right. It's another thing to do that thing rightly. Actions count as done justly or temporally are not merely because are not merely because they themselves are of a certain kind that is just or temperate, but also because of the facts about the agent doing them. So facts about the agent doing them. First, if he does them knowingly. Secondly, if he, if he chooses to do them and chooses to do them for their own sake. And thirdly, if he does them from a firm and unchanging character. <clears throat> so you can do something just, just because you do something of the type that that would um, be just, be considered just, it counts as just, right? But to do 
in action to, to perform a just action, but to perform it justly requires, um, um, as Aristotle notes here, um, doing them knowingly, right? So you didn't just sort of luck in unknowingly to doing the just thing in question. You knowingly do what you do, that's just. And then the choosing of what's done. So there's a choice involved in performing the actions. There's knowing and there's choosing the just action in question. And, you, and, and there's a choice that involves doing them for their own sake, doing them for the right reason, which involves just doing them for the right sake, for, for their own sake. Because, because one recognizes when one chooses and one knows that performing the just action, right, is just in itself the right thing to do. Because justice is the kind of thing that's good for its own sake. And then thirdly, if he does them from a firm and unchanging character, so it's not just a one-off that they know and they choose accordingly to do the just thing, but they also regularly do it. So it's as it were, the just action flows from a character that's habituated as it were to, um, to, to, uh, to perform the just action. Okay, so that's the basic idea. Um, continuing on, um, after some discussion of what choice involves, it's um, the, the prohoresis um, is, is a Greek term that we get from uh, the Aristotle on this. And uh, Hirsch also wants to say just a few things about what it means to choose. Um, um, you know, you're not performing the action by accident, not just on emotional impulse, right? Um, the reason is the thing that's gonna govern um, um, doing what you do. But that reason itself is flowing from right that character that's disposed right to um, attack for that reason. And as you know, Hershaus notes from this passage up here, the most significant clause is choosing to do the the um, the action, choosing to act justly, or choosing to perform an action that's just, right for its own sake, for it is this that rules out as we should say, doing the right thing for the wrong reason, which can happen over and over again, can't it? That's the case where you do what's right, but you did it for, but what you did was based on selfish motivations. It just turned out that your selfish motivation coincided with doing that, which is right. That might be the most common case of doing right. I don't know, this is sort of an empirical question, but, um, we say that some people who do just actions are not yet just. For example, those who do what is laid down by the laws, either unwillingly or through ignorance, or for some other reason and not for the sake of the actions themselves, though they do indeed do what they should and what a good person is required to do. Just ways in which you can do the right thing for the wrong reason in that paragraph. Is it true as in a virtue ethics that the excellent virtuous person is excellent virtuous in acting and feeling? The excellent virtuous person gets things right in both action and feeling. We can also start to make a list of the ways in which on a particular occasion we can fall short of this ideal. Take honesty as an example of the virtue as excellence in question. Example of the virtue as excellence in question. We can fall short in at least the following ways. Most obviously, you do what you know to be dishonest instead of what is honest, either because you are dishonest or because of weakness of the will. Okay, so maybe you have it, maybe an individual has a dishonest character, a dishonest character trait, and that leads to dishonesty. Or they know what's honest. And even if they're by and large, in many cases, act honestly, in some cases, they might find themselves too weak to do, to act honestly. You do what is honest, but, but not for the right reasons. Your reason might be a wrong, wicked reason. Think of the blackmailer revealing the truth about a victim who has defied, de, uh, defied him in order to show other victims that he's not bluffing. Or it might be uh, in a self innocuous, but never that's not the sort of, of reason appropriate to, um, to honesty. For example, to give an example of this kind of case, a bit abstract, a bit abstractly put there. For example, you might own up to something not simply because it is true that, whatever, that you did whatever it was, 
but because you can see that you're going to be found out anyway, and so there's no point in lying. And then thirdly, you do what is honest with the right, with the wrong emotions, excuse me. You might act unwillingly or, or, or grudgingly. I mean, I've been using the, the expression begrudgingly instead of reading, instead of readily and gladly as someone with the virtue would in those circumstances. Okay, so we've seen it, you know, we, we've discussed this, this idea as well. But particularly with respect to action, there are other ways of falling short as well, which come about through lack of phronesis or wisdom, okay, to which we shall return shortly. Okay, so phronesis is another um, Greek word that uh, Hearst House introduces the reader to there. So virtue as a character trait is also, it, 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 is a character trait that also disposes the possessor to act for excellent reasons, right? And we see that excellent reasons, um, it, uh, at least involved in part, um, uh, uh, um, performing an action um, for its own sake, especially when the action type is associated with something that um, has a kind of worthiness to be done for its own sake, like a just action, a temperate action, a right action. Okay. Okay, so we're up to the point where in the Hearst House, she, is, she moves on to this idea of virtue as a mean. Um, in thinking about virtue as an excellence, virtue as a kind of mean, and I put in parentheses here, um, golden, because it turns out that Aristotle's doctrines come to be known as the doctrine of the golden mean, which you may have heard of before in other contexts. And the way I'll put it is that um, Aristotle claims that virtue is an intermediate state of the soul between the extremes of excess and deficiency. So Aristotle, he, um, he goes through some options before he arrives at this view. So he wants to know like what like what general kind of thing is, vir is, is virtue. And then after figuring out what general kind of thing virtue is, he wants to um, figure out what specific kind of thing it is under the more general um, categorization. So um, in the Nicomachean Ethics, he talks about the genus of virtue and then the differentiae of virtue. So the genus would be the very general kind of thing that, um, that uh, virtue belongs to, and then the differentiate would be the species. Okay, so there can be a genus, and then underneath the genus, there could be a species, can't, can't there? So think about it like that, if you will. And so he, he goes through some options. He says, well, maybe maybe what virtue is at, in terms of his genus is, is it's a feeling. And he says, no, it can't be a feeling because a feeling is something that isn't sort of, um, isn't to be assessed in virtue of just merely having it. Um, it's having a feeling in a certain kind of way that um, uh, that's relevant, right? That can be assessed. So it's not a feeling all by itself. Um, so then uh, he says, well, what about a state of the soul? He says, okay, it looks like a state of a soul might be the kind of thing that, um, that we can assess. Um, the state of the soul is the kind of thing that we can evaluate. And not... Um, um, and, and we can perhaps do so um, in, in just very general terms. And so what Aristotle ends up claiming is that that virtue is to be understood in terms of his genus as a state of the soul. But then he wants to say, well, what's the species? What's the relevant, um, what's the relevant or the specific state of the soul that virtue is? Because there's lots of states of the soul, right? And he ends up blocking it on this idea that it's this intermediate state of the soul between extremes of excess and deficiency. And that's a bit abstract, isn't it? But it gives us the first initial clue to what, um, to, or to Aristotle's doctrine of the golden mean. So I chose this really bad picture to put on the slide here because you can't really read um, very well the white print on it. But I was more interested in just giving you the, giving you the image at this point. So we have the intermediate state, the balanced state, the virtuous state in between deficiency and excess. If we were to sort of just diagram his theory of the golden mean, 
this balance or this mean state, intermediate state between extremes. So I, I like to, I oftentimes will qualify mean with golden mean or mean with intermediate state. Um, just because if I say mean state, you might think about, you know, someone with sort of a, maybe, you know, um, maleficent um, motives or something like that. Someone with, um, you know, bad intentions. Um, so you might think about mean in the mathematical sense as sort of that balance state in between, um, you know, opposed um, more extreme states. Um, so here's an, um, just uh, another way of capturing uh, diagrammatically the golden mean from Aristotle. We have the balanced state, courage, generosity, ambition, modesty, honesty, good humor, friendship, temperance, composure, self-control. In Nicomachean Ethics, we get a whole range of these discussed. He's not trying to rewrite the book on what the virtues are. He's just trying to understand what the virtuous state of the soul is. And it's this balanced state, intermediate state between, again, excess on the one hand, deficiency on the other. The case that he likes to run a lot is the case of courage. Courage is a virtue. Okay, so he's not um, gonna debate that. That's true. Courage is a virtue, but how are we to understand it? Well, it's this, Golden mean state, this intermediate state, this balanced state between cowardice and rashness, or foolhardiness. In his discussion of courage, as anticipated um, a bit this time and even last time, um, what Aristotle has in mind is the presence of fear in the state of someone's soul. So someone's courageous when they have the right response to fear, such that fear it doesn't produce a deficient state of cowardliness. So there's a sense in which fear can make someone deficient in their responses. And when fear makes someone deficient in their responses to it, they're cowardly. Now on the other side, there are those who, when fear enters the soul, they just basically disregard it. They don't give it its proper due. And so they act rashly when that happens. They act in a foolhardy way and they don't let um what's they don't allow fear or you know reasonable amounts of fear to um influence um their response to it so think about the case of of a bully right um Imagine there you are and a bully uh, tries to victimize you. In that case, fear reasonably enters to your soul. How are you gonna respond to it? If, if you allow the fear to shrink you, to make you deficient in your response, that's what cowardice is on Aristotle's view. If there you are with a bully and fear enters your soul and you take no mind of the fear, so you have like the shirts used to say, no fear, then Aristotle would say that you have an excessive response to it, you respond too excessively to it, and you act rashly. And that might mean that you do things right, that are rash, are considered rash. Let's just maybe stipulate a little bit more. Perhaps what that would mean is perhaps you, you end up picking a fight with the bully. Right? Instead of recognizing that all you need to do is 
level with a person in a conversational way, or perhaps walk away from the situation, or perhaps call attention to friends nearby who can, with a strength in numbers type approach, avoid conflict, avoid a violent conflict or interaction with the bully. So that's how the golden mean works with respect to thinking about courage. Now, Aristotle ends up claiming that to have a courageous soul, to be courageous in terms of one's character, to have a courageous character is an extreme state in its own right. So even though it's this intermediate golden mean state, the fact that it's a golden state suggests that it's extremely hard to attain. Fear is just the kind of thing that's going to make us either def cowardly or rash. And what tends to happen, Aristotle says, given human nature is that when we're disposed to respond in a deficient way to fear, what will end up happening as we try to make our way to courage is we'll end up bending the stick too far in the opposite direction and become rash. And then we have to work on correcting that. It's almost like, you know, when, and this is something that's very Aristotelian, it's, it's almost like, it's a common way of discussing Aristotle's view here also, so I'm not claiming any um, uniqueness, um, originality. Think about like an archer who is aiming for the bullseye, but continues or continuously misses to the right. Well, in order to correct that, it's common for archers, expert archers even, to correct too far and they end up missing to the left. And then they have to correct again. So the archery example might be a useful one. It's very, very difficult to hit the bullseye. It's very, very difficult to hit the bullseye every single time. And that's what it takes to be a courageous individual is to hit the bullseye, not just once, not just twice, but as a matter of course. Now, another example that he likes to use um, is the temperance example. I think he thinks that um, it's easiest to wrap one's mind around these examples as he, as he explains the view. <clears throat> so temperance is a kind of self-control, if, you, if, you, if you've never heard of it before. Sometimes moderation is a term that's used here. I'm using temperance in part because moderation tends to be misunderstood, or at least it's contemporary usage um, is different from how Aristotle and the ancients and even others who've worked carefully on the virtues would use it. So this is kind of related to the Hearst House point about how virtue is used just generally earlier. So temperance, instead of involving responses to fear, involves the response to pleasure. So that's a significant part of our lives, is significant aspects of our lives are our responses to, to, to fear and pleasure. And temperance would be always responding perfectly as it were, well nigh perfectly to pleasure. Aristotle wants to say that we have to be careful with pleasure because too much of it or allowing too much of it into our lives is the kind of thing that will prevent us from doing what's right and will ultimately positively lead us to doing that which is base or wrong. So when, when we act in a deficient way, when we shrink because of pleasure, right? We become self-indulgent. We become intemperate. We don't use that, those terms, or that term much these days. 
We become indulgent, don't we? We become self-indulgent. When, on the other hand, we act um, too excessively to pleasure, we become insensible, right? Aristotle, I think, here says something like, we don't even really have a good term because it's just quite rare that people respond in an excessive way to pleasure. So they become insensible. They become hardly even human. It's just so natural for humans to pursue at least some degree of pleasure, to respond to some degree of pleasure. Um, so the, the excessive response to pleasure is the aesthetic response, the response that says pleasure is the root of evil. I'm not going to avoid uh, enjoying any pleasure. So once again, that, that temperance state, responding just right to pleasure, is akin to hitting the bullseye every time, or well nigh every time. Okay. You see the other examples here, friendship. Okay, someone acts excessively with respect to um, um, wanting to uh, have you know, social connections uh, by, being, by being too flattery. Right. Um, typically, that involves a bit of hyperbole, a bit of exaggeration in how you how you're assessing people, and then people act efficiently when it comes to their their efforts, their desires to be part of a social group by being quarrelsome, right? Not recognizing that being argumentative is the kind of thing that's gonna count against their friendship, or even they do recognize it, perhaps it's just something that they just have that sort of tendency based on how they're raised or otherwise to deal with others, an argumentative quarrel somewhere. Okay, let's just give you a few examples so you see how the doctrine works. I do think thinking about courage and temperance is the, those are the easy ones and Aristotle goes over them over and over again in his, in his works. Again, another just diagram here, we got virtue, vice deficiency, vice excess. So, the, I like this diagram because it captures the idea that deficiency and excess, they're vices. They contribute to a vicious character, not a virtuous one. Now keep in mind that Aristotle's view of the golden mean is not a theory according to which everything is okay, so long as it's done in moderation. Okay, so, um, as I've anticipated, according to Aristotle, that mean state, that virtuous state of the soul is itself an extreme state. So Aristotle is actually quite harsh against, you know, those who would, who would claim this moderation thesis. I mean, he calls it a trite thesis. It's kind of thesis that we, that we hear thrown, thrown around all the time, don't we? It's thrown out there all the time in conversation. I think that everything's okay in terms of moderation. Aristotle's reply is going to be, are you sure? Because some things are by their very nature base and wrong and foul. Adultery, drug abuse, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Certainly not true to say, is it that there's a moderate amount of adultery to engage in? There's a moderate amount of drug abuse to engage in? a moderate amount of hate, hate speech to engage in, a moderate amount of, of, of cowardice to engage in, right? So, um, so keep in mind that this theory of the golden mean is not to be understood as equivalent to these very, very trite and, and worn, tired expressions about Everything is fine so long as it's done in moderation. Aristotle says that's completely false. Okay. So now just some big picture um, claims about the Aristotelian view, the Aristotelian virtue ethics view. So at the base of Aristotle's um, virtue ethics is human flourishing. Remember that idea of eudaimonia. 
the theory of human flourishing, that the theory of eudaimonia is used to develop a theory of virtue. What are the virtues? The virtues are going to be those that contribute to one's flourishing. They're going to be those things that contribute, those character traits that contribute to, to human flourishing. And then a theory of virtue will be used to develop a theory of right action. So we're in this unit on normative ethics, which is concerned with right action. We've seen the consequentialist view, where theory of right action is going to drop out of thinking about good consequences. The duty-based view, at least the Kantian duty-based view, is the right action is going to be the one that involves acting in accordance with duty. The more the right action is going to be the one that involves acting in accordance with duty. Or not acting merely in accordance with duty, but acting from duty. Okay. Perhaps if you're Ross, think about Rossian a deontological view of right action. It's going to be acting um, in accordance with a prima facie duty, the relevant one in some particular circumstance or other. Okay, you get the point. This is supposed to be a diagram to capture the structure. So the virtue, the theory of virtue is more fundamental in, a, in, in Aristotle's virtue ethics. Um, the theory of right action in this normative ethical system. But still at the end of the day, virtue is not itself like the absolutely fundamental aspect to Aristotle's um, theory, ethical theory, because eudaimonia, human flourishing actually is. And then keep in mind that for Aristotle facts about eudaimonia, facts about human flourishing are determined by what's good for human beings. So facts about human nature are central to his normative ethical system. So there's a tie between, between um, human nature and the ethical system in Aristotle's virtue ethics. Okay. So I want to say a couple of things about Zagzebski in the last 10 minutes that I have tonight with you. So Zagzebski, she's um, someone who has been... Um, developing a novel kind of virtue ethics view, and she calls it exemplarism. Her view is going to be distinct from, uh, from Aristotle's. And so here we have this, uh, this concept in the theory of exemplars. And the concept of the exemplars is, or the theory of the exemplars is what gives rise to all the other moral concepts, because all the other moral concepts in the theory are gonna be defined in terms of the concept of the exemplars. Okay, that's a big picture way of understanding her view. Um, if you look at, um, I have her one of her papers up here. If you're interested in, in checking out this paper, let me know. So this is a paper, um, exemplarist uh, virtue theory, where here she kind of diagrams her what her view looks like. So the exemplar's view that she develops, we have G for that, for that person, the exemplar. Um, and there's a reason why she says that person we'll talk about um, in just a moment. But we have virtue, we have right action, we have good outcomes, and we have the good life, all defined in terms of G, right? The good person, the exemplar, the exemplar person, the exemplary person, the virtuous person, the admirable person, et cetera, et cetera. She gives other diagrams here that might be um, uh, pretty cool um, and helpful. Okay. You can see the Aristotelian one here, human nature, human flourishing, virtue, the, the good life and right action. Okay. All right. Um, so this is the kind of interesting diagram. You see how it's different from the Aristotelian one, even the Aristotelian one that I just had on the slide a few moments ago, and this way of capturing um, the diagram. Exemplars and then all the other moral concepts. What are the exemplars? They're paradigmatically good people. They're the most imitable people. The people that are most worthy of imitation, in other words, admirable people. We think about what it means to be admirable, it means to be worthy of admiration. You think about admiration, you're thinking about a feeling that we have toward others. And now in some of Zach Zexby's work, she's trying to figure out well, what, um, what traits does an admirable person have? What traits does the most imitable person have? Or the, the most, the intimate, most imitable uh, people 
What kinds of traits do they have? And there's a cluster of traits, right, that, that could be identified. Um, but they're never going to be sufficient on her view, as it turns out. She tried to work out necessary and sufficient, you know, uh, conditions or descriptive conditions, right, conceptually that would correspond to, you know, properties or features that are had by people who are admirable, most imitable, or the paradigmatically good people. But she saw that you, you couldn't actually, or you, it's very, very difficult at the very least, if not impossible to figure out what that list would consist in sufficiently. So exemplars are thus good and admirable people. Admirable people are people that we recognize by the emotion of, a, of, a, of, of admiration. So we might like recognize that someone has these, you know, really, really good qualities. We see that they're courageous, they're just, they're friendly, that they're kind to others, right? They're giving and all the rest. And, and, and we're drawn to admire them. And Zach Zespi's point might be something like, you know, that's like sort of like an imperfect list um, or, or a non-exhaustive list of qualities. Um, they may contribute in part to the fact that we feel admiration for them. Um, but it's, but those features that we recognize in those people isn't gonna be sort of exhaustive or complete in accounting for the admiration that we feel. And keep in mind that this admiration is an imperfect guide, but it's reliable like the other guides we have, just like, like our vision is a guide to seeing things in the world, but it's not a perfect guide because we can go wrong. The lighting conditions can be off. We can we can have um, imperfect vision, et cetera, et cetera. Admiration, right? This emotion, this feeling that we have that tracks something in the world on her view. It tracks at least in, at least in part, right, admirable qualities or ad, admirable people, more exactly. Okay. Now keep in mind here that, you know, sometimes people have immediate sort of counterexample um, thoughts. One common one is, well, what about admiring Hitler on her view? Well, again, admiration is an imperfect guy that may happen, but keep in mind that it's not as if as SC saying that there aren't any conditions or necessary conditions even, um, or necessary like, you know, uh, properties that guide us in sort of checking whether our admiration is tracking someone who's truly admirable. Okay. So a moment ago, I just listed off, you know, some qualities that we might identify in someone that we admire. The only point there was just that the qualities themselves weren't enough to account in every possible case for, right, what counts as the foundation of our admiration. Okay. So exemplars are the foundation of our ethical theory. So it's not, it's not eudaimonia, it's not virtue all by itself, it's virtuous people, paradigmatically virtuous people. So thus she uses, it's not he, she uses the concepts of exemplars to define all, all the other relevant moral concepts. So a virtue is a character trait of an exemplar, of an admirable, paradigmatically good person. So we think about what a virtue is as a character trait, which we've just gone through in the Hearst house, right? She's going to define what a virtue is. I guess she's going to define what a virtue is here in terms of an exemplar. And just as an example here, let's take a paradigmatic virtue, courage. Courage then can be defined perhaps in terms of a character trait had by Martin Luther King Jr. So courage is a character trait of Martin Luther King Jr. MLK Jr. is an exemplar, so we're gonna define courage in terms of this character trait had by MLK Jr. And of course, it's just one possible example. Right action, that's another moral concept. We have the concept of virtue, we have the concept of right action. We're going, to find the, we're going to find the concept of right action in terms of an exemplar. Surprise, surprise, or in terms of the concept of exemplars, right? So the right action is the action an exemplar would take to be favored by the balance of reasons in a situation. Example, Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa helps a person whose life is in danger in a situation where several others are in need. 
but whose lives aren't in danger. Okay? The idea here being that in this circumstances, Mother Teresa, right, she favors one action over another, and on balance, right, she's choosing the action that she should on the basis of those reasons. But anyways, we're going to find right action in terms of what the example our mother Teresa, right, would do or what she would take to be favored by the balance of reasons in a situation. Okay, we're not, defi we're not defining right action independent of what mother Teresa right, would take to be favored by the balance of reasons in a situation. It's what she takes to be favored, what she would take to be favored by the balance of reasons in a situation that defines what a right action is. And again, this is just one example. Multiply them. A duty in a situation. So we're finding the more we're finding the concept in our moral theory of duty. A duty in a situation is the action that that in that sorry is the action in that situation. An exemplar would feel guilty about were she not to do it. Okay, so an example here would be Socrates. Socrates would feel guilty if he didn't try to get the demons to care about virtue. Okay, Harriet Tubman uh, would feel guilty. If she didn't try to get um, slaves uh, freed, okay, that's just another kind of example. Since I use she in the defining of duty in terms of exemplars, I just gave example involving a she. Okay, a good state of affairs. So we're defining that moral concept, a good state of affairs in terms of exemplars here, the concepts of exemplars. So a good state of affairs is one that exemplar aims to bring about. Claire Barton aim aim to bring about less suffering in the Civil War. So think about who Claire Barton was. Red Cross, etc. Okay. So here's here's the theory diagram. We have exemplars, virtue, right action, duty, good states of the world. Okay. Now, key question: What exactly defines an exemplar in terms of their characteristics? We've already seen that Zach Desby doesn't think that we can offer a, an exact definition that involves necessary and sufficient conditions. In many cases, it's going to be the case that. When we come across an exemplar, we will, no we will notice um, features that they have, and those features guide us, right, in our thinking about the individual as admirable, as, right, as an imitable uh, source, et cetera. But it's never going to be perfect. So what um, Zach Zessi end up, ends up claiming is that there's a sense in which um, in addition to some of these qualities, we can, through the, through the concept of sort of good person right, or exemplar, we can immediately get to those individuals right, who are the exemplars. There's a sense in which um, there's a sense in which we are directly acquainted with the exemplars without knowing the necessary and sufficient conditions that make them exemplars. Much like here would be a sort of concluding idea. Much like we could be acquainted with water without knowing, directly acquainted with water, without knowing what the necessary and sufficient conditions are for something being water. Much like we could be acquainted with a tiger, right? To use another sort of natural kind term or a natural kind. Right? We can be acquainted, directly acquainted with a tiger, right? And, and, and we could refer correctly, right? Using the term tiger to tigers, despite the fact that our, our concept of tiger doesn't provide us with necessary and sufficient descriptive concepts for tiger because there's more to tiger than what our concept uh, contains. Um, there are other examples, obviously, right? Um, think about how we can directly refer to objects. I can directly refer to this thermos and using the term maybe this or maybe that. And even though there are a set of properties that we're acquainted with, Right when we refer to um, this object using the terms this and that, those descriptive 
qualities, they don't exhaust the nature of, the, of this object. So likewise, we can say that is a good person, says Zagzewski. That is an exemplary person. That is an admirable person, even though we don't have that sort of exhaustive set of descriptive conditions or qualities, concepts, right? In mind as we're referring to them, right? And so she can claim that we have some qualities that can guide us, but those qualities, right? They're not gonna ever be enough or they aren't at least enough. They, they, they needn't be enough more exactly in our successful reference to, or, or our successful thinking about um, these exemplars. And so what we do by way of supplementing this sort of incompleteness is rely on this reliable but imperfect guide of admiration, feeling of admiration, okay? That can go wrong in some cases, but we'd have to work, work, work through the infallibility, just like we work through the infallibility of our sense perceptions. Okay, I have further slides lined up to go through answering this question more precisely in the Zagzewski, but in the interest of time, I'll go ahead and stop there. Um, so what I've said there is, is a bit hand wavy and it's a bit, um, it's a bit um, rough around the edges just due to the time constraint. So if you have questions about, about, um, about what the view ends up amounting to, uh, feel free to let me know. There's, there's some, you might think heavy duty philosophy language that needs to get kind of worked out um, in order to really fully understand the Zagzebski here. But I just wanted to gesture at it. But if you want more precision and more detail, feel free to contact me and I'll clarify for you. So I'll go ahead and stop there and um, wish you all a great night. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and take care. Have a great weekend. Stay safe. Bye-bye.